Hey, and welcome to Things Worth Learning. I'm your host, Matt Stauffer, and this is a show where a computer, c- c- curious computer programmer, <laughs> that's me, <laughs> interviews fascinating people about their passions. So my guest today is Samira Kapila, the design director at ThoughtBot, an educator and a speaker, a former professor, I believe, but also the possibly only friend of mine from college, Go Gators, um, who actually works in the same industry as me. By the way, if you're watching on YouTube, I just want to share my um, amazing Gator Cup that I have got going on here. Um, so I think possibly my only friend from college works in the same industry as me, which is wonderful. And also just a really wonderful human being. So Samira, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, um, whether it's your personal life or your professional life? Sure. Hi. Uh, that was such a kind intro and go Gators. Yes. Come on. Uh, (laughs) I'm going to take a sip of my Gators Um, cup while you talk. Do it. Great. Uh, hi, my name is Samira. A lot of people know me as Sam. Um, intro. So Matt and I went to college together, Whoop. known each other since freshman year. Which you pointed out um, at the intro was 18. Well, I don't know if everybody else should know. We're old. 18 years. That's half of our it's lives. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm when 36. you said the half of our lives part, that's that when felt it really meaningful. hit me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dang. Yeah. Yeah. So I just thought I'd start right then. Um, I was in the graphic design program, graduated, thought I'd go into advertising, did that for a year, and then went to grad school in Texas, uh, thinking that I would get my master's to then be an art director. Mm -hmm. And because I was moving from Florida, I was hoping for in-state tuition. And they're like, how about you teach while you're getting your master's? And uh, then we'll give you in-state tuition. I was like, sold. Yep. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I could, I could teach. Sure. Yeah. Oh boy. Teaching's hard. <laughs> Turns out <laughs> teaching is so hard and, and you're only a TA for the first like semester or mm-hmm. so. And then your instructor of record, you are responsible for what? everything. And then you start getting TAs that are other. So you're like 23 years classmates. old and you have like TAs underneath you. Yeah. And, and 21 year olds as students. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's terrifying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> totally terrifying. Uh, definitely scary when you're five, two yeah. and like most people, most faculty in faculty meetings are like, student, are you lost? Yeah. Like, no, uh, so I'm, I'm was... one of you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. So that was, uh, that was fun. And I went through the program and, um, you know, midway through was volunteering at South by Southwest. Oh, cool. So yeah, you were in school in Austin, up. right? I was in school and I was in school 30 minutes south of Austin, oh, okay. coming up to Austin all the time. I mean, it's pretty much the same at this point. It's practically, you it's know, kind of been larger absorbed. Metro area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, South by volunteering was what actually moved me back into the web and away mm. from like the art direction and that side of things, because part of my responsibility was walking a lot of web developers and designers oh, from the green room uh-huh. to their talks and then telling a lot of employees from social media uh, companies that no, we don't have any more room for you to see your coworkers speak. I'm sorry. And they're like, we're going to call so-and-so right. and tell them I'm like, I fire marshal's going to shut it down. Yeah, yeah. Um, but getting to listen to those talks once we close the door, I was like, oh my goodness, this mm-hmm. is way more than what GeoCities, Angel Fire and MySpace were. <laughs> right. This has moved forward a little um, bit. Yeah. And uh, then I you know, through the grad program was able to make a switch into the web because I was talking about it so much and getting back into it myself. And we had a flash class that we were able to yes. rewrite into a responsive web design class. Yes. I like this. Um, and then I was realizing at that same time, I was really enjoying teaching because I was teaching something I was super passionate about and graduated and stayed on teaching hmm. for a while. Yeah. Um, since I was that designer who codes <laughs> sort of person, um, I ended up working at a code school after that, mm-hmm. building out their design class that was Photoshop, Illustrator, HTML, CSS, some JavaScript, and Terminal and GitHub work yeah. all in 12 weeks. Yeah, no big deal. Um, yeah, and it was, yeah this no big was, deal. This was, was one of the big, reputable code schools. We're not talking just just a little local thing. You were, you were a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the Iron Yard, 21 different locations, um, and I wish it was still around, uh, but it is not. Um, But building the design program there, suddenly being a part of the like first 10 employees (laughs) ended up managing all of the design and engineering courses. So I had members of my team that were Ruby developers, Python developers, JavaScript, everything across the board. Here comes one cat. 
she may just pop a tail Love in. It. Hopefully she won't mute the call. <laughs> um, she always thinks I'm talking to her. Of course. And at that point, I wasn't doing any design. I was mm -hmm. barely getting to code because I was managing 40 instructors and trying to hire 40 more. Yep. Um, so that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> and we grew and we grew and it was a, a lot of a big change. And then I completely moved away from that and was in operations mm. and diverse, diversity initiatives. Okay. And so it's just been a series of pivots. Yeah. And yeah. then I finally went back to being an individual contributor and then a manager again at ThoughtBot. Yeah. And it's funny because, oh, so when I, when I reach out to somebody and say, hey, I want you to be on the show, I don't say, here's what you should talk mm -hmm. about. I say, what do you want to talk about? But often I like, here's a couple ideas I have. And it was so funny kind of talking to you being like, well, it could be this, this, that, the other, this or that, the other. Like, there's so many aspects that you <laughs> could have a fascinating conversation. I was like, I think I might need to introduce the idea of the same person coming on multiple times about different things. <laughs> Like we picked one for today, but like there, you got a lot going on and you were kind of like, for those who weren't around in the beginning of the responsive design world, there was kind of like, it was introduced as a concept. Um, mm -hmm. and like there was the one book, but then everybody was kind of like figuring it out as we went. And it took a little while for it to be a little bit more like accepted and systematized. And I feel like mm -hmm. maybe it's just cause I knew you, you were like at the forefront because you're hanging out with all those people in Austin. You're like, oh yeah, when I was getting beers with Chris Coyer the other day, whatever, and all these other people, <laughs> but also you were a professor or whatever the technical term is, you're an instructor. And so you were connected mm -hmm. to like an institution, right? And so you were kind of like, it's just so fun because I was like, wait, I know Samira. Like I know Samira from, I don't even know what class we like bookmaking class or whatever it was. I was like, I know her from college, but you were really kind of leading a lot of this, like how to teach it and how to think about it organizationally. And so that was a really cool moment. And so, but now you're doing like stuff at ThoughtBot, which is, if anybody doesn't know, is like one of the premier, like, is it still mainly Ruby these days? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, lots of Ruby design and mobile. Okay. Yeah. So, so like ThoughtBot, not only is terms in terms of premier in terms of that particular tech stack, but also just in terms of like, if you think about, at least from my perspective, companies that are innovating and how to do like what we do as consultancies or consult, yeah, as consultants. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like ThoughtBot and 30 seconds, seven signals have been two of the really kind of the biggest leading people. So again, once again, mm -hmm. like now I'm like, oh, okay. Now you're like big deal. There's big deal. Iron yard, big deal. This. So anyway, I'm sorry. I'm just like hyping you up because I think you're great. Um, so, <laughs> <It's very sweet. laughs> so, okay. So we've known each other for this long time. You are now a design director and you're working in some engineering management stuff, which I know we're going to talk about, but I have one question I always mm -hmm. want to ask the guests. Hopefully this kind of works out well before we get into your topic, it, which is, do you have any sort of life kind of mantra or phrase or idea that you try to live your life by? And I know I just sprung this on you right before we started, but <laughs> does that pop anything into your brain? Yeah, it, it does. I think because of that background timeline that I just shared that started in education and was weaving through education. And just because we work on the web and it's still this young thing that, um, you know, can't even buy beer yet or, right. yeah. <laughs> or something like it's, it's evolving and it's growing and it's changing over time. Uh, I think the forever student mindset mm. is something that's like core yeah. to my bones. I love that. Um, because that was, I mean, for being a volunteer who just like checks badges at the door and yeah. makes sure the fire marshal isn't bad is why I ended up back in the web. Yeah. Like, and when I say back, I mean like actually professionally, yeah. not my space pages. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> uh, that's, that's fascinating to me. That's something, you know, I went for the reason that you would volunteer was so that you would get a badge to everything else mm -hmm. to, to music and film and whatever else. And that the larger benefit was such a big life pivot. It's mm. just sort of being open to those things and being a forever student. There's always something to learn. I love that. It's, uh, this is not your mantra, but I did notice that both of those have to do with um, things that are ancillary to what you thought you were doing. So like with South by, mm -hmm. it was, you know, you were there for the music and for the shows and, but, but you, you didn't just focus on that. You saw an opportunity and you said, I'm right. going to try this other opportunity with school. You, you were like, well, I really like to have this in-state tuition. They're like, can you teach? You weren't there to be a teacher, right? Like you were there to learn, but you're like, yeah, there's this other opportunity. I'm gonna try it out. And so like taking those different yeah. opportunities, like it's, it's both like that you're learning, but also that you're just willing to try something different and see value in that, not be kind of like just stuck on one particular route. So I think that's really cool too. Yeah, I, I never thought of it that way. That's a really great point. <laughs> Look at this, we're discovering things. Okay, okay, so transitioning to what we're actually talking about today. So you know this podcast, at least each episode, even if you're gonna come back later, is about one particular mm -hmm. topic that you're very passionate about. So could you tell me what are we actually gonna talk about today? Sure, I think, um, you know, given that background history, I've been the type of person who's always gonna try to weave those things together. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think about education. I think about it in the schooling perspective. I think about it in, in onboarding new team members perspective mm -hmm. and how we grow. Um, but then also understanding how organizations work and things that can change. Something that's been front of mind is, is leadership and specifically inclusive leadership. Mm. I know we talk about diversity and inclusion, but I, I look at this more as a way for people who do and also don't have leadership titles yeah. and what they're empowered to do to make the workplace better because it is just such a time yeah. that a lot of these things are, are you know, reaching a point that we need to fix some things or we need to all be a part of that change. Yeah. I love that. So that's, that's really what's been in the forefront of my mind. Well, I already have questions. So this is great. So, uh, okay. I think most people understand the concept of diversity and some people have heard about like diversity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, together mm -hmm. as concepts or as like a team or a person's role. But I do think that like the decision to use the word inclusive versus diverse is something that I think a lot of people haven't heard a kind of a backstory behind. So before you even talk about the specifics of how this applies in the leadership context, can you talk to me about what inclusivity means to you? Yeah, I think um, inclusivity, I think, is the more um, actionable word. Mm, I diversity love that. is like, oh, diversity happened, yeah, right? Uh -huh. There's there's this sort of i even remember like in college getting the like uh course brochures and it's like every type of student it was like a, a united colors of benetton yes. catalog <laughs> that's like yeah that's the yep it's a yeah. diverse group of people uh -huh. but inclusion and inclusivity is the work that it takes mm. to get there and not just that people are invited in yeah. but that in a workplace in a classroom or in you know within a four-year program how are we retaining them? I love that. How are we setting them up for success, not just throwing them into the mix and hoping that they succeed on their so own? So you're telling me that if I'm a white guy, which I am, running a company, which I am, it's not just good enough. And I, I was saying this originally jokingly, but I'm actually turning it to not a joke. If I'm running a company and I'm saying, oh my gosh, I have a primarily white or primarily male or primarily American or prim primarily straight or Christian or whatever else, it's not just enough to get the people in. There's more work to be done. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me a little bit about that concept? Because I'm sure that happens as a part of leadership. But like, tell me about like, what is what's the difference between just getting people in versus actually, you know, keeping them like you said, retaining them? Yeah, I think there's a I, I don't think people do this maliciously, but I think a lot of people think maybe at a subconscious level, like once we get more people in the door that are quote unquote diverse, yeah. um, then we've solved the problem. Yeah. But what happens is when they're the only minoritized mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. in that group of people, they're having to do extra work mm -hmm. above their own job to fight for themselves, to share different perspectives. And they have to go through a lot of calculations of, mm -hmm. is this worth the risk? Does this risk my job for bringing this mm -hmm. up? You hired someone to do a particular job and you're putting them in a scenario where they have to suddenly represent all of these other things yep. and add even more to their job. Oh my goodness. There's so many good points in that. Um, so, so, okay. Like, and I hope this is the angle you wanted to go and stop me if it wasn't, but let's say, mm -hmm. cause and I, I think I'd say this in part because I get a lot of business owners and hiring managers who kind of like say, Hey, we want to, we want to do this. Um, you know, how do we do it? And the problem is the answer is often like, well, first of all, we don't have the hiring pipeline, which is a whole different conversation, but let's say you can get the people in the door. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Let's say you can get the people in the door. Um, you mentioned some circumstances, like one of the things you mentioned was that if somebody comes in and the, the, they're one or one of few minoritized people, first of all, they're they're breaking new ground, right? Like you said. Second of all, mm -hmm. they're a minority also in being a, a smaller number of people. But third of all, they're not the people in leadership positions, right? And so like they're, mm -hmm. they're put, getting put all this responsibility put on them. So I think the question for me is where would you like to get started talking about how people can the existing people can be a part of making a change so that that's not a difficult experience for them. Does that have to start at the leadership level? Is this something that everybody can do? Like what is creating and fostering an environment that when your first minoritized person steps in, they're comfortable? What does that look like? That's a great question. I think, yes, there is some responsibility for leadership. So I'll start there and then move to others that are not holding said leadership roles right. that can still act as leaders. I love it. From a leadership perspective, I think um, really looking at certain things like benefits, do they mm. include everybody? So, oh, sorry if I just hit the mic. Yeah. I, I wave my hands around everywhere. That's why the YouTube so part of that... this is so cool. I'm like, I, I can't <laughs> wait for people to see everything. I should just bring sock puppets yes. and like act, <laughs> act stuff out. Next next time. I'm going to grab my little, um, my little toys and just kind of <laughs> yeah. act them out. Sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, sounds great. Um, I think there's something that everyone can do. For an example, a lot of leadership in HR can review things like the benefits mm-hmm. that are offered. Um, something like, do our healthcare providers have mental health support? Come Does on. that work, um, you know, in a tele, mm-hmm. whatever this remote life yeah. is right now? Yeah. Um, you know, is parental leave the same for all parents? Is it the same for, for a biological child, mm-hmm. adopted mm-hmm. child, legal guardianship, yeah. et cetera? Um, you know, what does paid leave look like? What does um, sick days look like? That's a part of that too, yeah. because people just have different perspectives or different things that they're dealing with in their life. Yeah. Um, outside of HR, which I mean, there's a lot of examples there, but leadership, they are the ones who can set the example. Mm-hmm. So if someone who is marginalized uh, or historically marginalized mm-hmm. and is spoken over in a meeting, a leader has the responsibility mm-hmm. to speak up and say, actually, before we continue, you were cut off. Can you finish your thought? Yeah. Or if someone takes an idea saying, actually, this was so-and-so's idea. Yeah. That's that's the biggest thing that they can do is in the right moment, mm-hmm. be the leader, because that basically gives permission to the rest of the team yeah. that it is okay to support that team. I love that. So, and setting okay. that example is the responsibility of leadership. That is amazing. And I, I so I think that there's a couple pieces there. Um, I'm going to use myself as an example only because this was harder to learn than I expected. Um, mm-hmm. There's one piece that was hard for me to learn, which was I'm a naturally people pleasing, conflict avoidant person. So stepping in when somebody has done something wrong, something I think we all like mildly wrong, but not ex- easy to point to is something I think we all have familiarity with, like somebody tells a mildly off color joke, but it's not like straight up wrong. It's just like something that makes you a little uncomfortable, like developing the ability in those personal situations to say to be the one who like makes everyone <clears throat> uncomfortable and just be like, no, that was not cool. And then people are like, why are you like, you know, messing with the vibe here or whatever. Like that's something that many of us have kind of just, especially those of those majority cultures have, have had to endure or have not yet endured the, the experience of, um, like choosing to make yourself and your friends uncomfortable, um, for the sake of doing the right thing in that moment. And I feel like this is that, that discomfort with conflict, that discomfort with speaking up, even if you know, think people are going to like, look at you, like, why are you always making this a big deal or whatever? definitely applies Mm -hmm. in work situations. And I do think that people in leadership more often than not are also people from majority cultures or, you know, whatever else you want to call Mm -hmm. it, like who have not yet experienced the need to be the one making things uncomfortable in that particular way. So I can certainly speak to the experience of just like, let's say if you knew exactly what to do, there's going to be a part of you that just doesn't want to do it. Right. And feels like, Oh, Mm -hmm. am I going to make this a big deal or whatever? Am I going to be the person who's always talking about class or race or sexual orientation or whatever, when it's maybe not there. But like, I think a lot of people needing to do that is one thing, but like even knowing how to identify the problems when they're happening is another, I think a lot of us are just, um, unfortunately, um, ignorant of what the negative experiences of being a marginalized person would be in a lot of those things. So I think I have a lot of people who, whether or not they're right, when they say, if I saw it, uh, if I, if I knew what was going on, I would actually speak up, but they wouldn't, they Mm -hmm. literally would say like, I don't even know what to look for. You did give us a couple examples, like being spoken over or somebody else taking credit for their work. Those are big ones. Do you either have a, like some other examples or B like it, some ideas of how someone in that situation could go about like changing their life such that they are more ready to identify those things when they happen. Are there books or people to follow on Twitter or podcasts or other tools that they can use to Mm -hmm. start getting more ready to notice those things when they happen? Absolutely. I think one of the largest parts that I've noticed in diversity and inclusion education or training is a lot of people didn't have the vocabulary for Mm -hmm what to call those Mm -hmm, things. mm -hmm. Like they may have been aware of it, but they didn't know that they, there was a word for it. And when you have a word for something, then you can look for solutions and, you know, Google or talk Uh to other people about certain things. So the two examples that I posed are a lot of times, uh, categorized under microaggressions. Mm -hmm. They're things that aren't the blatant Mm -hmm. exclusive or ism, you know, racism, sexism, ageism, like they're not the easiest to identify because they might be a backhanded compliment Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. um, something like uh, someone getting cut off in a meeting. But the same thing that happens there is with, with microaggressions is that if you um, see those and you're like, Hey, something was off here. 
you can also assume good intent. Like there's a few ways to tackle something mm -hmm. like a microaggression. It is, you could bring it up in that moment and say, hey, I know you didn't mean it this way. Mm -hmm. Because that also gives that person the out to uh, correct themselves rather than yeah. shaming them. Yeah. Um, but when you interrupted so-and-so, mm -hmm. we didn't get to hear their complete idea. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited that you're excited, but I'd really love to hear yeah. the end of this. That's great. So-and-so, would you mind continuing? Mm -hmm. So that's a great way to not shame either of that. the parties and really bring it back on like, I'd actually really love to hear more about this. Can you finish your thought? Yeah. And it's, it's not shaming anyone. And then... I think a lot of people think that because they didn't bring it up in the moment, the time has passed. Mm -hmm. And what you can do as a team member is go up to that person and say, hey, I know you were mm -hmm. interrupted a lot in the meeting. In future meetings, would you like me to support you? That's cool. I'd be happy to. Yeah. Is it okay if I go talk to the other person without naming you and saying that I noticed yeah. that they were cutting you off a lot? And so you're, you're making sure with people's boundaries that they're okay with that. And someone may say, no, I don't want you to talk to them. I'd prefer to keep my head down yeah. or next time I'll fight for myself. Mm -hmm. You're giving them the, the choice. Agency. Yes. I love this. And asking them for permission to help rather than forcing yeah. that help. White knighting a little bit. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Which only makes us feel good. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah. so with things like that, there are a lot of examples of once you learn these words, there's a lot of resources online. There's a lot of diversity coaches mm -hmm. and trainers. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the the I know you didn't mean it this way, or I think you didn't mean it this way, came from a diversity trainer that I've worked with in the past. Oh, cool. um, and it's just a great way to kind of work through the, the scary parts and the conflict parts yeah. and, and just help nudge someone hopefully in the right direction you're giving them a chance to correct themselves yeah. um and you're assuming the best there's... the best intentions like you said which i love yes. so they're not thinking oh yeah. you think i'm terrible now i need to get better they're like no i think you're probably a very yeah. nice person here's something i've learned or whatever yeah i love that and i think a lot of uh, a, a really important part of leadership and why i kind of put most of the onus there is when those minoritized, you know, first person to join the company mm -hmm. from an underrepresented um, identity. Actually, I should say marginalized because it's been kind of done to them. Yeah. Um, they're expected a lot to educate everyone else. Yeah. And that is not their job. Yes. Again, they were hired for a completely different yeah. task. It is not their job to educate someone else on how to how they use a wheelchair or how they go about writing code um, with um, a um, like a site disability. Like a yeah, exactly. Disability. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's important for other people to step up in and do that work yeah. or at least ask for permission and not assume that that person wants to do the educating. That's great. And so there's a lot of great resources on that on online. Um, a lot of them specifically in the United States, there is a lot covered by ADA. There's a lot of examples on how to interview people with different oh, cool. identities. I love that. Um, like there's a lot surprisingly in, in a lot of our government sites yeah. that tells you tips on how to um, have accommodations for certain interview mm. uh, interviewees and not to ask them questions like, well, how did you drive here right. when your, your leg is, uh, you know, yeah. in a cast? Yeah. Um, and things like that. Like it's, it's really just about giving that best intention forward. And Love that. so tell me what you can bring to this job yeah. and treat them like everybody else. Cause they know how to work with their, yep. their identities better than anybody else. That's amazing. Um, so the question I'd asked you there was like, what could someone do? And what you just kind of said was there's endless resources. We'll, we'll try to link some mm -hmm. of those in the show notes. I'll, I'll try to find some to link. Um, I'll ask you for any I, that I you love. I was just going to say, I'm sure you got a bunch. Um, but I would yeah. say that, like, end of the story, like, if somebody is looking, like, really truthfully, actively looking, I think it's safe to say that you can find resources out there teaching you how to do it. I think a lot of it is mm -hmm. that many of us find ourselves in a situation where we say we care about those things, but aren't willing to actually put effort into it. Um, and that's a much longer conversation that we certainly don't have time for today, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. it feels to me like, if it's something that we really recognize that someone can find themselves being this first person in the company and stepping in the first day and not feeling comfortable and easy, I think that a lot of it will naturally flow from there. And I think it's the presumption of if it's comfortable for me, it's going to be comfortable for everybody else that maybe keeps us exactly. from doing that. Yeah. I don't know if that me saying that leads you anywhere, but is that kind of, is there anything you would yeah. want to say in response to that? 
Yeah, I think one of the first things that's taught in a lot of diversity training is about unconscious bias. Mm, okay. And it's, again, it's not about shaming people. Yeah. It's about recognizing that there are some unconscious parts of ourselves that we're not aware of and how they may affect others. So the example that you pose, something that's comfortable for me would be comfortable for somebody else. Yeah. That's an unconscious bias, mm, right? You're okay. not aware of it or you're assuming that it's the same. Yeah. And what unconscious bias impacts is there are things, everybody has bias because of the way we were raised, something in society that told us something was normal or the way it should be. Um, and it assumes that everyone has best intentions and just didn't know another perspective. Mm. And mm. so a lot of the work that people can do can start with that. There have been examples of things. I think um, Harvard did an implicit bias, which is another way to say unconscious bias, mm -hmm. where it helps uh, you catch certain things uh, that That's you may cool. have not noticed before. Yeah. And, and, and that covers race um, and, um, and uh, gender and, and some other parts and you can do different things there. Some people don't like that test okay. model, which there are going to be different examples of things out there, but doing any work in unconscious bias and really self reflecting on like, how did I act in that meeting? Did mm -hmm. I do anything to support anyone or asking for feedback from other people, mm. which can be tough because sometimes people don't want to give you that difficult feedback or you either. don't want to receive that um, difficult feedback. Ooh, yeah. It can be hard. Yeah. 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 So I think um, there is a lot of self work of mm -hmm. where where could my biases be? Um, am I operating in a way that is harmful yeah. to somebody else? That's really helpful. And just because I, I think another part is also just because someone else isn't saying it doesn't mean mm -hmm. it isn't mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. The idea right? people wait for the evidence. Well, nobody told me. Yeah. The idea that there can be a cost to a having to think about that all the time when you're also just trying to do your mm -hmm. job, but then be a cost to speaking up. Like my business partner, Dan and I were always like, Hey, we're totally open. You know, you can talk to us about anything, but we learned very early on. Thank God. We learned that like, just because we say that does not mean that people can feel comfortable saying anything to us. Like we're still the ones who sign the paychecks. We're still the ones who give the, the, right. the progress reviews or whatever. So that's really helpful. One thing that has helped us is to have a person at the company whose job is to be available for all that stuff, who is not a supervisor, who is a known advocate for kind of like basically marginalized roles and stuff like that, and who people have learned through a lot of their interactions, like has no gain in putting somebody in a dif difficult situation and has direct access to me and Dan. Um, I'm really grateful for the person in that role and having that role as a concept in our company, because now we know that people can go to her much more comfortably than they can go to us a lot. And so we're like, great, that's fine. As long as it gets to us eventually and you all feel safe doing it. Are there any other kind of like systems or practices or roles that are a little bit less about personal reflection and a little bit more about systemic stuff where you're like, you know what, if every company did this, this particular more systemic mm -hmm. thing, that would actually be like a really valuable thing. Ooh. Uh, there's a lot, a lot there. I'm glad that there is someone that people can go to, but at the same time, it is still yes. you and Dan setting, 100%. setting the, the, yeah. um, the tone. And we also still sure. have the responsibility to that. That doesn't relieve us of the responsibility mm -hmm. of trying to fix ourselves. It's just one more tool, hopefully in our toolkit, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I think another uh, thing is when someone brings up those things, specifically if they are coming from any marginalized identity, mm -hmm. um, I think systemically right now, there's an assumption that just because they're bringing it up or they have the expertise in that like diversity buzzword mm -hmm. because they brought up something that they're affected by that they want to be the ones to work mm. on it. And that is almost, almost never true. Case. I yeah. know that's a big generalization for me to make, but why I think so strongly about this is that assuming that they want to own that mm -hmm. is again, adding more work to their plate. And if they're coming to someone in leadership to bring those things up, that's, that's already them the work. Asking yeah. Help. yeah. 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 That's good. I think one of the most powerful things that ever happened, um, was there was another marginalized coworker and I bringing something up about the hiring process and we rehearsed our meeting mm. together with each mm -hmm. other. Um, we had our notes ready and it's like, okay, well, we'll split up the work because we were trained basically by the tech industry yeah. that we if you bring things up, you know, choose your battles and you better have when it you perfectly. Do, you're going to have yeah. extra work. Mm -hmm. And we, we mm. took things up. Um, you know, it was something that we, we believed in and we took things up and it was the first time either of us had 
someone say, thank you both so much for sharing that. That must have been such mm. a burden. And that was, th that acknowledgement was huge. Yeah. And then our jaws dropped when they said, this is my responsibility to fix it. I love so that. So here's what my next steps are. I love that. That is so good. And we, they, they got off the call and, and that person and I stayed on, on zoom and we're just like, uh, <laughs> did that just happen? Uh, wait, we can just, we can just go just back to yeah. our client work. Oh, I love that. Like, okay. And, and we were followed up with yeah. as those actions were, mm -hmm. were taken. Um, so that, so it's not just, you know, saying those yeah. things when someone brings that feedback up, it's, it's what we do in meetings. It's setting the, okay, so here are action items from this meeting. Yeah. Here's when we're going to get them done by, yeah. I'm going to follow up when I have more on this part mm -hmm. and, and working through it from there. I love that. That is brilliant. Um, it's only happened once though. Yeah. But it's cool because I think that if you think about people who've told the horror stories of what happens at their company when they bring things up, the first thing is, of course, mm -hmm. does the person believe you and respond well? But then the, the next right. horror story is always, and then nothing happened. Like that's a very common one. And so yeah. to hear the combination of those two done well is amazing. Um, yeah. I feel like I want to talk to you for three hours. And I just looked up and I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh, has this really been 30 minutes already? I don't know if I'm going to stick with this 30 minute podcast thing. I don't, I don't have to figure this out. I, I think we were, we were jamming out to the intro for we, a bit. We did so. for a real minute. Like I, it, in my head, <laughs> I, I thought there was going to be a timer in this thing. Uh, just so you know, there's no mm -hmm. timer, but I think, so anyway, I'll give us a couple more minutes. Um, <laughs> I have a thousand questions, but I first want to make sure what else about this topic did you hope we were going to be able to get to? Um, is there anything else on your mind? Ooh, I mean, there's a thousand things exactly, I can right? bring up there. Yeah. <laughs> That's tough. I think, um, I've been, you know, thinking about, I, I mentioned to you, I was thinking about our nine credit, um, workshop class freshman year. Mm -hmm. Um, that was kind of the weed out yes. of art school. If you're not going to take it seriously class, because I, if I recall, we had to do like a project in each major that existed mm -hmm. also do the seminar class. And it was like 12 hours of studio a week and three hours of the seminar. Yeah. Um, so I've been thinking about education a lot and just mm. realizing how much of what we're taught in school isn't exactly mm. inclusive either. Mm. Okay. Tell me more about like, this. I would have loved to, I would have loved to have a class or within the web class, even talk about accessibility. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> like we spent so much time, you know, talking smack about comic sans yeah. and it's one of the most right. legible fonts for kids because it's pictorial shapes and that's how their memory is forming at that time is very visually I didn't not know that. Wow. by by reading mm -hmm. i think it's like up to age eight or nine okay. it's also a really helpful font for anyone with dyslexia yeah, that's what i had heard yeah um so like we had this like oh it was cool to hate comic sans because that's what people talked about and we didn't actually get to like how does design yeah. help people and what do we right? do it's instead job. it's like size 10 yeah. gray text that hardly anybody can read because it looks cool, right? That's like the exact yeah. opposite of what is actually useful for people. Right. Poster design class was about making a poster look cool, but does it work from across mm. the street? Is it still legible? Yeah. What if someone's in a car? Yeah. What if it's a billboard? And how does height play into Oof. that? A lot yeah. of things that, you know, the ADA, when they're talking about signage design covers, there's a reason that certain signs, even for a, a, a door plate, mm -hmm you know, in a building that has a bunch of classrooms and it has braille on it. It's at a certain height. So someone in a wheelchair can reach it as well. Oh, like, yeah. There's all of this stuff that we never really covered. Mm -hmm. And even in art history, it was so Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And graphic design only starts uh, really with like Gutenberg press. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's like day one. Yeah. <laughs> so many more examples of it. I think like sometime in this past year or maybe who knows what is time yeah. <laughs> sometime, <laughs> sometime in the last, the last five yeah. years, maybe um, it was found. I think like they uncovered some stuff under the like big Pompeii explosion mm -hmm. and found a food cart that a lot of the tile work at the front of it represented what food was made. Wow. By. And it was such a cool visual system that I felt really matched with uh, like iconography mm -hmm. and the way that we talk about making an icon set yeah. because they all had a similar background. They all had the same like grout distance yeah. between tiles. There was a system yeah. there. Like we should be talking about those things and we should be talking about design from a more worldly perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are things I've been thinking yeah, God. is like design education needs a little bit of a rebrand Yeah, or not a rebrand, just kind of a overhaul. Maybe like a rebuild from the ground up kind of situation. 
Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, if that happens in school, then that starts to change our industry. Mm-hmm. But we could have those conversations in, you know, book clubs or design growth and lunch and learn meetings at work, too. Yeah. I think that's super valuable. One of the things that I found is that, um, at least in the programming world, some of the most influential teachers don't come up with new ideas themselves, but they find ideas that are in a different discipline or even like for in in our world, I I work in PHP and one of the Mm -hmm. guys who's been most influential in our particular world goes to the Ruby world and says, what are they doing there? And then contextualize it in PHP and we go, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And all the Rubyists are kind of like, yeah, we've been doing that for a while. You know, like, (laughs) and so, but it's very interesting for me because like, if you were imagine that someone weren't to need to feel this like pressure to be super innovative, but instead say like, as a designer, how can I be the designer that understands just what came from Pompeii, just what came from China, just what came from uh, Brazil or something like that? You know, like, what are the things I can do to just bring these contextual ideas or historic ideas or whatever that have been known and studied for ages, but wasn't a part of my American or Eurocentric um, art education? How can I bring those into the general populace in, of designers? And just that, right? Be a mm-hmm. ar- archaeologist, histori- historian, sociologist, you know, cultural whatever ethnologist and just do that like does is there space for that right now like someone to not even having to reform the entire education system but just to like make it exciting make it accessible to people Uh, that's a really interesting idea yeah there's uh there's a group of people that are doing the uh bipoc history bipoc design history i'm trying to remember the link but i'll get you the link and last year they did a whole series on african-american and african influence in design so a lot of protest art Very cool. a lot of texture a lot of color and i think they just announced their uh latin american history course and this Very is online cool. and you can take this i love this that's awesome um all right because i am trying to wrap it i don't want to wrap it um <laughs> i would say I, I think that i have one unexpected question for you which is gonna try and make it make you even shrink things down even more if i am either a designer or a programmer and i don't own a company but I want to be a part of making change at the company I work at. So we've talked about the industry a little bit, but if I want to make change at the company I work at um, to make it such that when I do have, or if we already do have coworkers who are like minoritized in the company and also in the industry, like what is like a couple things that I can do practically? One of the things you talked about was just reflection internally, but are there any like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to call them easy steps uh, cause they don't need to be easy, but like, mm-hmm. can we say at least to do this and this, at least here's your baseline. Are there any things that come easy to you or is it more you really just got to figure out what, what it is for you? I think the the group setting parts really matter. So whether that person is talked about mm-hmm. when they're not there and you know, it is that sort of like that was a really kind of awful joke Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it didn't harm them directly, yeah. but having that conversation with that person that's a, the and first sometimes thing. that needs to happen with like the, that water cooler conversation. Yeah. It's it's using those opportunities in group settings to to speak up. And and you can say it from your perspective. You don't have to say you harmed so and so because that's maybe not what some so said. Yeah. It's again going back to that. You may have not meant it this way, but the way that I'm interpreting this is really harmful yeah. towards that person. Yeah. Um, so I think that has a lot of power yeah. is of, of bringing those up in group settings, whether the person harmed by that behavior is there or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, um, I mean, there's so, there's so many different things, but, um, if you have ideas or things that you want to bring up, having conversations with other people and seeing how they feel about it, having conversations about salaries, um, you know, informally and, and seeing if everybody's being paid in an equitable way and then banding together to work through larger things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I think, I think a lot of group work, you know, outside of that self-reflection can be really powerful mm-hmm. and impactful. It helps set an example. It helps you feel like you're not the only one, you know, fighting for something. Yeah. Um, that can that can do a lot. And people can bring a lot of different perspectives into it that we wouldn't have considered. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think I'm going to take that to transition to my last question for you, which has a little bit of relevance uh, because mm-hmm. I, I kind of want to know from everybody, like what it was that that help them get where they are. And uh, when we were talking about uh, what topic we're going to do, one of the things I said to you, because I want other people to hear this is, I don't want to just say, hey, you know what, I've got a woman of color in my podcast, I'm going to ask her to talk about inclusion or whatever, you know, that was a decision you made of your own volition. And I'm I'm glad you did. Um, But I think that 
because you do happen to be a woman of color who've come up in this industry, this question I hope to ask everybody is, is particularly insightful, which is what insight or support did you receive or need when you were younger that you hope more people will give to others? And w when we were talking earlier, one of the things I said was it doesn't have to be when you were younger like a kid. It could have been when you were mm -hmm. coming up in the industry. Um, so I'm curious kind of as you've been thinking about that question, like kind of what is that? What comes up for you? Yeah, I think um, I think sometimes we all get a little bit too busy with our jobs, mm -hmm. right? To mentor and support others, mm -hmm. and mentorship could be towards students, or it could be that volunteer yeah. walking you from a green room, <laughs> and and that's really how it started. Mm. I, I remember one of those people was Jeffrey Zeldman. Oh yeah, who I was walking. He's like, oh, so you're in grad school. So what are you learning? Huh. What do you know about the web? And, and huh. that's how that conversation started. And he stayed in touch for years just to be like, how are you doing? Do you need anything? Do you have mm. questions? Um, and having people like him and a lot of the happy cog folks and, and parable folks that were local to Austin yeah. asking themselves, Hey, do you want us to come talk to students? Do you want us to look at portfolios? Mm. That, that was hugely impactful. Like they were actively trying to bridge the gap. That's awesome. And maybe, you know, some of them maybe hadn't been speakers before and it helped them build confidence to speak. So it actually helped both sides. Yeah. It helped students who ended up being, um, you know, apprentices or interns at their companies mm. gained their confidence and they already, they got to know people in the industry yeah. that when they mm -hmm. went to their first meetup, they're like, Hey, I know that person. <laughs> they reviewed my portfolio. Mm -hmm. I feel safe enough to go up to them. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, like the, the paying it forward or passing it forward has so much more of an impact than people think that it can. Mm. Um, and I think also for a lot of managers or what I wish was taught to anyone becoming a manager, I think we were to assume that because a job description is written, everyone must kind of fit that cookie cutter. Yeah. Hmm. And what I learned at the Iron Yard was that the more differences there are between your team, the better. Yes, come so on. So when I look at hiring, I'm looking for the gaps that exist on my team. Yeah. Um, and for a role that they have to be the designers who code, I trying to grow a team that one is really good at consulting another might be really good at code and can go into like heavy Ruby stuff. Yeah. Another one could be an incredible illustrator and need to work on some HTML and CMS, right. CSS. So I think, um, instead of looking at job roles as this cookie cutter, like try to get maybe like half of the things met, yeah. but really look at where the gaps are on the existing team mm. so that everyone has those different perspectives. That's a part of building a, diverse team in terms mm. of skill set too. That's really cool and really great. And like code schools are not bad. Code schools are really good. Like graduates from there should be considered as much as a four year person, a two year community college person or a self taught person. Yeah. I love that. Um, so if somebody thinks that you're amazing and brilliant, um, I will be linking your website as of, of course they will. I'll be linking your website, and your Twitter and everything like that in the, the, um, in the show notes, but is there anything else that you would love someone to do to follow you, support you, or just be involved in something that you're really passionate about that you think they should go do basically how, how can we, how can we follow you? How, how can we pay you money? How can we support you or the things you care about? <laughs> Honestly, Twitter and, um, and my site are probably the best okay. at this point. Yep. Um, Twitter, I, I, I think with the pandemic, writing has just generally been hard. Yeah. So I think I have like a January 1st and a January 2nd of 2021 yep. um, post, but that's about it. And really a lot of Twitter is just telling people about my dog <laughs> um, or yelling about Texas politics. Yeah. Um, but but those really are like probably the places I am the most. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Those are probably the best. All right. Well, those will be linked, but it is uh, samcapilla.com and at samcap on Twitter and you check the show notes for those. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else you just realized you wanted to say, or are you feeling good for today? Well, I already said go Gators. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Although I haven't watched a game in forever. Oh, me neither, um, but I still no, I think nothing else is, <laughs> nothing else is coming to mind, but I am so excited that, uh, that you asked and I'm so glad that we could catch up, especially cause like you said, we've known each other half of our lives yeah. and, and to be the first time I realized that. You and I were both in that web world. I was like happy yes, hands <laughs> clapping. Like, that's so cool. Yeah, I showed up my <laughs> friends. I was like, I know that. her. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Samira, I really, really, really appreciate you being willing to, and I said this at the beginning, but to take a take a risk on this this new thing. You've never heard any episodes of this podcast and you're willing to jump on it. Thank you so much. And of course, I appreciate your friendship over the years and everything you're doing for our community. Everybody, go follow her. Go check out everything she does. And uh, she's great. So until next time, be good to each other. 
Thanks. Bye.